year 10 and year 11, welcome to some additional notes on Mr Berlin, especially if you're aiming for the higher grades, 7, the 8 and the 9. Very quickly we'll get started. You shouldn't need the top section, but just in case, a reminder, he is the owner of Berlin and Company. He's the head of the family. He's obviously a successful businessman. He's rich, irritable, traditional, self-centered, impatient. Uh, we know from the engagement and from the way he addresses the inspector that he likes to be in control. He is a public figure and he's obsessed with social status. Again, we know that from a couple of the, th the things he says to the inspector straight away. In terms of a morality play, remember this is not only a political play, it is a morality play. And Mr. Berlin metaphorically represents the sins of gluttony because he's greedy and pride because of the way he's obsessed with his name. I suppose metaphorically then one of the things Mr. Berlin is used for in the play is to discredit capitalism. Remember he makes a lot of foolish claims at the beginning of the play which again dramatic irony is going to help us with. Uh, I shall come to dramatic irony in just a moment. But if we were to look at the stage directions and I think you should be commenting on the stage directions for every character then we get hard-headed, pretentious and provincial. Now, again, we need to be analysing Priestley's language here. You know, you can argue that the adjective hard already foreshadows him and implies that Mr. Bill isn't going to change. His beliefs are narrow-minded. And we know that actually he is a one-dimensional character in this play because he starts and ends the play in the same way, with the same ideals, with the same values. Um, The adjective pretentious there very serious and significant, especially with regards to future events, excessively serious or pompous. So again, when we get this idea that he's serious and significant with regards to future events, it serves to do the above, which is to discredit capitalism. Because remember, his uh, beliefs about the future are totally incorrect. And actually, he comes across as a little foolish. And then we also get provincial which is unsophisticated, unwilling to accept new ideas or new ways of thinking, which we can link to the adjective hard. And as we already discussed, there's massive foreshadowing in the stage directions of Mr. Burden because we know he is not going to accept socialism. He's not going to accept that he has a role to play in Eva Smith's death. And and, and by the end, actually, he, he laughs, doesn't he? He thinks it's a bit of a joke. The engagement then, through Mr. Berlin's eyes, it's a business arrangement. You've brought us together, he claims. Again, look at your pronoun us, which leads to the next bit about the lower costs and, and the higher prices. Um, and actually what we get here is that capitalism is used as exploitation. And we say that in this line, lower costs, higher prices. And if you want to really analyse this, you know you've got the juxtaposition of lower and higher. And you've got the punctuation. Look at the comma. It emphasises the disparity between the classes. The fact that Mr Berlin controls pay, controls the charges. Therefore, actually the problem you've got now is that everyone is exploited the people that work for him and the people that buy his product. And we realise that this, this action is immoral. This exploitation of everybody that he deals with is immoral. Priestley's point then is that the end game and the whole point of cap capitalism is to make as much money as possible. And, and there's no concern for those who are suffering or who are less fortunate. Our dramatic irony then becomes huge because of history. We, and the audience at the time, know everything that has happened. And he makes a ludicrous claim that soon it'll be an even better time. Look at your adjective, better. Obviously, we know it doesn't. After the First World War, there is massive industrial unrest and the whole country is destroyed by 1926. And then there's the Great Depression of 1929. So this claim that Mr Berlin has made is, is highly inaccurate Again, reminding us of the earlier stage direction of hard-headed and pretentious and provincial. He mentions Labour trouble. In 1945, the Labour Party won. They didn't just win, it was a landslide victory over the Conservatives. So again, he's incorrect in every prediction or every statement that he makes in the opening of Act 1. We obviously suffered two world wars. And then what Priestley does through Mr Berlin again is that he criticizes the ideas or the ideal or the belief that capitalist followers 
understand humans. And remember, Berlin says it's everything to lose and nothing to gain, but that's just not how it works because the suggestion now is that Mr. Berlin doesn't even understand how war works. So when we hit the Great Depression, it meant that people were too poor to buy products. So after the First World War, there was not only industrial unrest, but economic unrest. And perhaps capitalism then is breaking down. And then when we go further and we get steadily increasing prosperity, well, as, as mentioned, the prosperity was non-existent after the war because it was wiped out. Obviously, millions of people suffered. And then what you ask yourself is, well, who does profit? The manufacturing industry profited during the war because we had to buy um, the products and the goods to enter a war. And we see that excessive pride is a problem and a fault. The hubris then um, of Mr. Berlin, he doesn't realise the horrors of his own business. He talks about planes and ships. Ships and, 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 and technology advancing, problem being that planes and ships make war easier, doesn't it? Um, through the Titanic, it's almost as if the Titanic is used to ridicule Berlin. You know, pride before fall, everyone thought the Titanic wasn't going to sink, and it did. Therefore, metaphorically, are the ruling classes seeing themselves as the Titanic, indestructible and unsinkable? Perhaps you could argue that. And then when we get this flippant remark about 1940, again, 1940, we saw the Blitz, we saw Dunkirk. It was, it was an awful moment in history for Britain. If we move away from dramatic irony and excess of pride, then we've all, we can also take into account Mr. Berlin's language. And as um, the play progresses, his language breaks down. And the first instance of that is under the, the examining and interrogation of the inspector. And I've just used one example. She would a lot to say pause far too much pause so she had to go and you can see we've got hesitation a lot of and a lot of punctuation there to suggest this idea that Mr Berlin is perhaps not as powerful as he once thought he's not as in control when he comes up against the the inspector as he thought we've got this uh, capitalism and socialism coming into conflict Uh, another way Mr. Berlin is used to represent the callousness of capitalism, his character is used to criticise the fact that capitalist people and capitalist believers and followers are complacent. Um, as the play progresses, he's described as panic-stricken. Uh, Priestley then indicates say, that Berlin's defiance and bravado were gone. And the audience, actually, we see someone who is blindly wrong and who... Was he ever really in control? Perhaps not. And and don't forget, I'm going to mention in a moment, Mrs. Berlin was his superior at one point. By the end of the play, Mr. Berlin reverts back to his callous nature. You'll have a good laugh yet. Uh, and the stage directions reflect his inability to sympathise and empathise with the lower classes or with his own actions. And we get the horrendous adverb triumphantly when he's speaking. And we also get that adverb with Mrs. Berlin. And it's it's awful to think that they um, are speaking as if they've won a battle, as if they've won a contest. They are victorious in some way. They're expressing jubilation and achievement. Again, ask yourself, what have they achieved here? The exploitation of a young girl. And then I suppose you can argue that actually pre uh, Berlin is the villain. He's presented as the villain and therefore capitalism becomes the villain as well. As I mentioned just a moment ago, Mrs. Berlin is Mr. Berlin's social superior. So as mentioned at the beginning, social position is important in Mr. Berlin and that stage direction foreshadows his behaviour and attitude. But it also reminds us why the engagement is so important to him. Advancing yourself in terms of your wealth, in terms of your social position, because he seems to have done it. And now arguably he, he's uh, influencing Sheila to do it as well. Social position then, I was Lord Mayor here two years ago, there's a very good chance of a knighthood, the bringing together of Crofts and Berlin as mentioned, and then that quote, a man has a mind to, to sorry, a man has to mind his own business and look after himself, with, which massively contrasts the inspector's last speech as well. If we wanted more in language, his language becomes dismissive, 
He uses language like fiddlesticks and silly. He belittles other people's opinions and displays ignorance. And it is this ignorance which shows a disregard for the poor. And remember, it is this arrogance, uh, sorry, ignorance that reminds us of hard-headed and provincial. The Titanic, I just want to say again, it symbolises his own family. He believes they're untouchable and he uses an exclamatory sentence when he discusses it. Absolutely unsinkable. So again, the ignorance is shown there. This notion that the Titanic's never going to sink. This, this metaphorical idea that we are untouchable. Nobody can come for us because we're powerful. We're rich. Our social position is valued. And then once the inspector arrives, arrives as I've said, his sentences are, are short and fragmented of horrid business. He shows hesitation, powerlessness in the presence of the inspector. And actually his language becomes colloquial, you know. It's as if his control and authority breaks down a little bit like Sheila. She goes from mummy and daddy to mother. It's a little bit like that, although in this instance, his is the opposite and becomes colloquial, whereas Sheila develops from colloquial to standard. A couple of quotations you might want to mention there. If you want it, again, you don't need me to discuss them all. Have a look. I'm a public man might be an interesting one. The press, you know, the notion that, oh, God, what we're going to do when the press finds out what we've done. And then some key quotations from the end. Uh, just note there again, the fact that it's a joke. It's nonsense. We've been had. And then just a final reminder, he is stereotypical of a capitalist businessman, heartless, ruthless, concerned with himself and wealth. And then if you wanted to prove that, a socialist or some sort of crank, lack of sympathy. Um, there's fleeting sympathy for one second about giving thousands, but it's just too late. I hope this has been useful. If you need anything else, I've got a more detailed video on Mr. Burden. Please have a look. Check out my YouTube channel for anything else you need. And massive good luck in your English Lit exam.